Good evening, everybody. This is the time for the City Council meeting of June 20th, 2016. We'll start with a roll call and determination of quorum. Your mic's not on. Okay, belt it out. <laughs> okay. Right? Weifenbach? Doyle? Estes? Here. Lewis? Here. Drew? Here. Roberts? Here. Nordstrom? Here. Scott? Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Now we'll have the uh, invocation by Trish mm -hmm. Jurgensen, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll join us. I searched the scriptures for three days, even while I was fishing and couldn't find anything, so I came up with this. One of my favorites, it's in 1 Corinthians 9, and it's 9.24. Do you not know that the race, those who run in a race all run, but the one who's, who receives the prize run in such a way that they may obtain it? So, Lord, we just come before you tonight. We ask your blessing upon this city and Mayor Allender and the city council men and women. Help them to make decisions based on the well-being of the citizens of Rapid City. We pray over the city budget, unity within the city, county, and state government. Give our leaders strength, courage, and wisdom to carry out the tasks at hand. Guide their thoughts, words, and deeds in this room this evening and help us to resolve differences and walk in a spirit of trust and re reconciliation. We give you this evening, and we thank you for it, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll go on to the adoption of the agenda. Um, unless there are any items to, uh, Move to approve. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Now we'll have a moment or two for awards and recognitions. Can I have David Gross come up, please? In partnership with the Veterans Coordination Commission, we are pleased to present the June 2016 Veteran of the Month recognition to David Gross. Mr. Gross enlisted in the Army in May of 1986. He completed his basic training and advanced individual training at Fort McClellan, Alabama. His field of study was nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. He completed jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. While in training, he broke his leg on a rough landing, but he went on to complete one more jump anyway to finish the course and graduate. He was stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina and also at Nuremberg, Germany, where he worked as a chemical reconnaissance specialist. At the start of Desert Shield, uh, his platoon was given a top secret mission in southern Bavaria at a German military base. His job was to find hidden chemical weapons and protect the division personnel from biological weapon attacks when they arrived in Iraq. During his military service, Mr. Gross received the Liberation of Kuwait and Southwest Asia Ribbon, Army Commendation Medal, Army Achievement Medal, and Army Good Conduct Medal. 
After completing his tour of duty, Mr. Gross returned home to his family in Nebraska to join the National Guard. During this time, he went to school and graduated as a respiratory therapist, quickly advancing in his field. After many supervisory positions, he was hired at the State of Nebraska Veterans Home to be the Chief Operations Officer. This was a very rewarding job for him in so many ways, taking veterans to parades, Memorial Day services, and fishing. He learned a great deal during his stay in Grand Island. Mr. Gross continued his schooling and received a master's in business with a minor in nursing home administration. Mr. Gross and his family moved to Rapid City, uh, that is with his wife and five children. He is currently working at Ellsworth Air Force Base as a financial technician. He still continues to study. In two years, he will be graduating with a bachelor's degree in information system forensics. The Gross family has been part of the Disabled American Veteran Organization for a year, volunteering at several functions and most recently the state convention held in Rapid City. The family finds it very rewarding to be serving with and for veterans. Mr. Gross has been serving our country since 1986 with dedication and sacrifice, making him an excellent Veteran of the Month. His example of service makes him deserving of this honor, and we'd like to extend our gratitude. Thank you, David Gross. I just like to say I, I believe it's my job and all of our jobs to protect our country and keep our families free as America needs to stay free. That's all I got to say. Listen, let's get a picture up here with your family. Scoot over here just a little bit. Now on to general public comment, which is a time for the members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the council on any issue not on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda, except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the council members present. And for general public comment, we have one speaker request form from Mr. Steve Stenson. You can approach the podium over here, sir. And you have three minutes. Is this the location? Yes. Well, I'm Steve Stenson. I'm running for the House of Representatives for District uh, 34 as a Democrat. And I just wanted to present myself here to, uh, to say thank you. Thank you for uh, Mayor Allender for all he's done. And uh, you know what, uh, what uh, changes have happened here. And then I also know Jeff has done a wonderful, a remarkable job of the park system. He's been a friend. And uh, so I'm a supporter of all of you. And I just mostly just here to open myself up as I try to, as a Democrat, to bridge together to see if I could help with any issues that maybe uh, we can work together on. I also do stress manager workshops, and I did the National Guard here not too, uh, in February, the whole National Guard, and I hope to work with the, uh, uh, I worked with the Phoenix Police Department, and so I'm hoping to work with uh, maybe law enforcement here uh, locally too, but um, I am, um, my, uh, my issue, my, my thanks, and my curiosity is also with this, uh, the new software for the uh, accounting system and how the transparency that was built to help with, um, how that's coming along, your impressions, and 
are there any takeaways on uh, future development as far as software and privacy and so but those are the issues but first I thank each one of you for all the hard sacrifice I watched you many many hours on television at night usually but uh, it's special to be here so thank you thank you now we're on to non-public hearing items items 3 through 37 uh, we'll open public comment on those items and then uh, close it as there are no speaker request forms on those items. So we'll go straight to consent items, items 3 through 29. Does the council have any issues that they want to, any items they want to take off the consent calendar? We'll go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. If I could have item number 29 pulled, please. Okay. Are there any others? And can we have a motion to approve consent with the exception of item 29? So moved. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. All in favor of that motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. And uh, on to item number 29, which is to uh, approve the transportation improvement plan draft. We'll go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. At the planning commission meeting, um, which I serve as a liaison on, uh, Kip Harrington came forward and gave a briefing of what streets projects are happening, not only in Rapid City, but in the county and also some state projects as well. And it was the most thorough report on the next five year plan of streets that I've ever seen. So mayor, if you would indulge me, I've asked Kip to please come and give it to the entire council. He did a very wonderful job on giving the five year plan. You mean sometime? Uh, now. Or right he's, now. Yep, he's here. <laughs> he's here. <laughs> Come back later. Three minutes. And it was less than five minutes, seriously. I don't think Kip took that long, but he really let everybody know or gave a really good briefing, and, and there were some documents attached that really shows from Box Elder to Rapid City out to the county of Nemo Road. He covered all the streets that were going under project within the next five years. Okay, can you cover this in five minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Kip. Good evening, Kip Harrington, Long Range Planning. Every year we produce what's called the Transportation Improvement Program, which details all of the, I'll get to it, yeah, details all of the projects coming up, both city projects, state projects, and the county projects as well. This map's kind of hard to see at this scale, so we'll zoom in a little bit and focus on Rapid City a little bit. I will start by listing some of the major state projects that are going on. In 2017, I-90 from Tilford, which is exit 40, to Piedmont, which is exit 44, will be re completely reconstructed along with the exit 44 interchange. Again, that's 2017 at a cost of approximately $35 million. In 2020, the I-90 exit 59, which is the cross street interchange, will be reconstructed into a diverging diamond interchange. That'll cost approximately $20 million. In 2020 as well, I-90 exit 46, which is the Elk Creek Road exit, will be, the interchange will be reconstructed at a cost of approximately $10 million. Next year, 2017, U.S. Highway 16 through, this, through the city, also known as Mount Rushmore Road. The middle section and final section will be completed. That goes from Florman to St. James Street. It's a cost of approximately $7 million. In 2018, South Dakota Highway 231, also known as West Chicago Street, will be constructed from Shepherd Street west to Sturgis Road. That's this yellow section right in there. And that's a cost of about $12 million. Also in 2018, the intersection of South Dakota Highway 44, Omaha Street, and East Boulevard will be reconstructed at a cost of just under $1 million. In 2019, the further east section of South Dakota Highway 231, which is West Chicago Street and West Omaha Street, from Shepherd Street to Mountain View Road, and then South Dakota Highway 44, which is West Omaha Street, from Mountain View Road to 12th Street, which is this part in red. That will be reconstructed for about $13 million. And then a state project out in the county near Box Elder, Pennington County Highway 1416. There will be some intersection improvements to Radar Hill Road and Commercial Gate Road intersections at a cost of about $3.5 million. We'll be adding some left turn lanes to improve safety on those. Highlight some of the projects in our city capital improvement program. In 2017, 2017 and 2018, the Jackson Boulevard and West Main Street intersection will be reconstructed at a cost of just under $1.5 million. Seeger Drive from 143rd Street to North La Crosse will be rebuilt in 2017 at a cost of just under $2 million. 
The middle section of Anamosa Street between Milwaukee and Midway will be rebuilt in 2017. The either end has been done, the west end and the east end. This is the middle section, and that'll be about three and a half million dollar project. In 2018, there'll be a widening of Katrin Boulevard from US Highway 16 to Sheridan Lake Road to the west. That is a cost of approximately $1.2 million. Also in 2018, Sheridan Lake Road from Canyon Lake Drive up to West Main Street will be rebuilt and widened, and that will be $3 million in 2018. In 2020 and 2021, the southern portion of Sheridan Lake Road from Corral Drive to Catron Boulevard will be reconstructed at a cost of about $3 million. And in, also in 2021, North Maple Drive, just north of the mall, from Disc to Mall in purple here, that'll be reconstructed for just under $2 million. Some of the other major projects in the area that are done by the counties. In Meade County, Elkvale Road from the county line north to Elk Creek Road, and then Elk Creek Road west from Elkvale Road to North Haines will be paved in 2017, and that will cost approximately $3 million. Also in Meade County, Erickson Ranch Road from half a mile north of Peaceful Pines, north for five miles up to Elk Creek Road, will be, re will be paved in 2018, and that'll be just over half a million dollars. And this doesn't show on our map because it's outside of our metropolitan planning area, but it's in the news a lot, so I thought you guys might want to hear this. In 2021, Fort Meade Way will be paved just east of Sturgis, and that's at a cost of about $4 million. And Pennington County's got some big projects coming up. In 2017, South Rochford Road will be paved from Rochford to Deerfield Road at a cost of about $10 million. Sheridan Lake Road will be paved, repaved from US 385 all the way east to Alberta Drive, which is near Countryside. In 2018, that's about eight and a half million dollars. And in 2019, Nemo Road will be repaved from the North County line to approximately Palmer Road at a cost of just over one million dollars. I'd like to remind everybody that the state projects will be, a public meeting will be held for the statewide transportation improvement program that will be held July 19th at 7 p.m. at the Ramcota Hotel. Department of Transportation staff will be there to take public comment on these and other projects. So if you have any interest, please plan on attending. And I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a few questions for Kip, if I may. Is that, um, re restate that date again, Kip, uh, one where the STIP is going to be meeting. That's July 19th. Thank you. At 7 p.m. at the Ramcota Hotel. I think that's important for a lot of folks that uh, are involved with our transportation system. So uh, I encourage as many people to attend that uh, meeting as possible. A lot of good information there. Kip, I've got uh, some questions uh, to, in general terms, if you could help me out here, is how is this going to affect some different areas within the city? Uh, in conjunction with these projects. The CIP, how is that gonna be affected? Are we gonna be able to do anything with bridges? Uh, some uh, Finding some additional funding for the bridges? And then the transit is another er area that I'm very interested in, and it has to do with uh, uh, the, specifically the bus transit system that we have right now and what we can look forward to in the future for that. Sure. As far as bridges go, there is a new program through the Department of Transportation called the Bridge Improvement Grant Program, also known as BIG. Rapid City applied for and received three different grants to reconstruct bridges, one on 12th Street, one on East St. James and Cherry Avenue, and then one on Campbell Street as well. Uh, total cost of that is approximately $737,500, of which the, the BIG grant was $590,000 and the city share of that was 147,500, so it's about an 80-20 split. Uh, that's a competitive program, and so the city can apply for that every year and may or may not get awarded depending on the, the committee that selects the, pro the projects. As far as transit goes, we are currently working on a request for proposals to complete a transit feasibility study, which will take a look at Rapid City's transit service, look at maybe expanding the service to longer hours, more routes, more days of the week, and also look at the possibility of expanding it outside the currently li outside the city limits, which currently does not service outside the city limits. In order to do that, there would be some additional funding required by maybe Box Elder, maybe by Pennington County, Meade County, any of the government en entities that would participate. And the study will take a look at what would be required for that to happen as well. 
Thank you, and I just want to be clear that it, these are just proposals on the transit side of it. Yes. And then, and then in the long range as well. It, uh, again, going back to the CIP question, is how, uh, what can we anticipate for the the capital improvements projects that we have within the city? I listed some of the major city projects earlier in this presentation. The rest of the CIP is included in the draft report. And since it is the draft report, the final will come back before you as well, and that should be late July, early August, after the STIP meeting. Are you anticipating any major reforms to, from this draft to the final? Uh, not for city projects or county projects. There may be some in the state projects, depending on their public meetings that they hold for the statewide transportation improvement program. Very good. Thank you. Excellent job, Kip. Thank you. Pre appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Yield. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion to acknowledge and a second. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Now on to non-consent items, items 30 through 37. There are no speaker requests on these items, so we won't have a public comment. We'll go straight to number 30, uh, Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 30 is the first reading of Ordinance 6118, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by KTM Design Solutions Incorporated for Richard M. Kincaid for a rezoning from low density residential district to light industrial district for property generally described as being located at 3775 Dias Avenue. Make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item, please. Item number 31 is the first reading of Ordinance 6119, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by Advanced Engineering for Mark Simpson for a rezoning from General Agricultural District to Light Industrial District for property generally described as being located north of Fountain Plaza and South Plaza Drive intersection. I make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. All in favor of that motion say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 32 is the first reading of ordinance number 6120, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by Advanced Engineering for Mark Simpson for a rezoning from General Agri Agricultural District to General Commercial District for property generally described as being located at 1750 Fountain Springs Drive. I make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion and a second for approval. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries. Now on to item number 33 under Public Works Committee items. We'll go to John Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number PW042616-15 approved the dead or diseased tree removal program. This was continued from the May 2nd, 2016 City Council meeting. And I recommend to continue to the July 18th, 2016 council meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to postpone this until July 18th. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 34, please. Item PW053116-22, authorize mayor and finance officer to sign a construction agreement with Black Hills Energy for relocation of 69 kv power line on landfill landfill property continued from the june 6th 2016 city council meeting and i recommend to continue this to the july 5th 2016 council meeting second. okay we have a motion and a second to postpone this until july 5th all in favor of that motion say aye aye, aye. opposed motion carries on a number uh, 35 under Community Planning and Development Services, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number 16PL050, a request by FMG Incorporated for Holiday Companies for a preliminary subdivision plan for Lot 1 of Holiday Subdivision, generally described as being located at the northwest corner of Elkvale Road and East South Dakota Highway 44. I make the recommendation we approve with stipulations. Okay, motion and a second to approve with stipulations. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now on to item number 36 under alcohol uh, beverage license applications. Uh, Matthew Sullivan doing business as uh, Adelaide Inc. Juniper 
5734 Sheridan Lake Road, Suite 207 for a retail malt beverage license. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for approval. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Now under mayor items, number 37. We have a uh, request for temporary free landfill use and landfill rate reimbursement for Hermosa residents for disposal of tornado debris resulting from June 13th, 2016. And we'll go to Jerry Wright. Thank you, Mayor. I think the request to grant free landfill use should be denied. As I understand that the owners and so forth are working with their insurance companies and have putting it on an account of one of the owners in the area and there will be a tabulation of the expenses for the disposal. That's not a lot. It will be covered either by insurance or by individuals. And in that case, or if it can't be, then we can discuss it then. But at this point, there's no reason for us to take a position to, group, to grant free access to the landfill. It would be a bad precedent. It hasn't been done before. Make a motion to deny the because I can't already suppose. Okay, we have a motion to deny and a second. Uh, just for your uh, information, we have two um, residents here, one from the uh, American Red Cross and one from Hermosa. If the council would like to question them, the, uh, they have indicated an interest in speaking. As of now, we have a motion and a second to deny the request. And we'll go to Brad Essis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I see one of those speaker request forms is a gentleman by the name of Todd Stainbrook. And I guess if he'd be willing to take the podium, I got a couple questions for him. Okay. Yes, Todd, if you would, if you would state your name and your address, please, for the record. Todd Stainbrook, uh, 24148 Elkin Lane, Hermosa, South Dakota. Thanks. And, and, and I, I understand uh, Alderman Wright's motion. I, I, just, I just happened to know that, that Mr. Stainbrook, I talked to him today, and, and he said that, uh, and I'm not sure on what advice and based upon what meeting, but the group had gotten together and, and uh, started doing their cleanup and, the, and I think it's nearly done and, and I think Todd it's your account that everybody's been charging on now did you my question is did did you uh, authorize everybody to charge in your account based upon the thought that there was going to be something done or, or were, was there something said or something that led you to believe that the, the well, city the was going to do this? it was reported that uh, one of the owners told me or one of the people that had the destruction mayor had already approved it and that it was in the newspaper on Saturday that the landfill fees would be waived and so but it, it all started Tuesday right afterwards I had a meeting with all the homeowners down there my, my property was not immediately affected but a lot of my neighbors were and if you guys didn't see the destruction this debris was scattered everywhere so it's hard to say whose was what and what we got volunteers immediately that Tuesday, a couple of the homeowners, they already had groups of people down there combing the ditches, picking up all this trash and hauling it to the landfill. And I said, just run it under my account because everybody was concerned on how they were going to pay for this and what they were going to do. And this wasn't just coming from one land. This was scattered everywhere. So in the course of that week, um, there was probably 200 volunteers that had come down and helped clean up all these properties and we filled up dump trailer. We didn't take account of where it came from or whose land it came from. We just cleaned everything up to get these people back up and, and uh, get their land cleaned up. And I just let them run it through my, my account at the landfill. And the total on the, of the bill, uh, Linda and Gary and Dennis at the landfill kept track of every truck that came in. They had to specifically say it was under my account. It came from the Spring Creek Acres tornado damage. And the total was $2,062.82. And I know that a lot of the landowners that have the destruction hauled off their building stuff, and they already paid for that, and they are turning it into insurance companies. A lot of this bill that we're asking is just stuff that was scattered all over everybody's land that we picked up and hauled stuff off from. Thank you. 
I, I yield, Mayor. Thanks. Okay, uh, we'll go to Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll turn, substitute motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. Just my, my point on this, I guess, would be I appreciate what Alderman Wright's probably saying and I understand we want to open up the floodgates, but for everything that comes through, but obviously this is kind of a rarity around here to have uh, in a storm like this, an, an event like this, and I do think it's great that the neighbors have got together, even though they're not residents of Rapid City, they're definitely part of Rapid City in a lot of ways, so to get together and, you know, work together and get a little more of the story, I appreciate that, sir, and that's m the, the spirit of my motion to try to help you out a little bit. Thank you for helping in your community. We appreciate it. Now we'll go to Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. If I, if I may, I'd like to have Carl from the landfill, if you could approach the podium. Thank you, Carl Murbach, City of Rapid City, Solid Waste Division Superintendent. Carl, so you heard something about a precedent, so I just wanted to ask you, have we done anything like this with neighboring communities before, uh, Storm Atlas being even more recent to uh, impacting just Rapid City? So if you could answer that first. Right, I know with Storm Atlas, uh, while most of the debris was related to vegetative type debris, the tree damage, there were a number of people that were without power that lost a lot of things, refrigerator items, other things too. At that time, there were no uh, things made or nothing made to allow any type of disposal from that. It was uh, widespread and was not. The only other one I'm aware of, and Mr. Wright would probably know a little more, was back in 2007 during the flood in Hermosa uh, there was a situation worked out where I believe it was 50% was reimbursed for that. Somebody can help me out with this, I see. Okay, so um, have you been able to ascertain the impact of what's been brought to the landfill? I mean, do we know, uh, do we have a handle on the amount? And it doesn't seem like a lot being $2,000, but I don't know exactly how much each load cost. But well, and I've, I've kept in touch with my folks at the scale house. It was mentioned there. It has been, you know, sporadic coming in, but overall, I don't think it, you know, it has been a lot other than, you know, what was charged to this gentleman's uh, account there. Other than that, it's been individual loads that have come in, and if somebody did not identify that as storm damage, it was just transacted as a regular load to the landfill. Okay. Well, and I, I uh, obviously seconded the motion, but. Uh, you know, as a precedent, it would seem like to me, I'm even more willing to set this type of a precedent, helping a neighboring community that might not have the ability to rid themselves of some of the debris, like uh, the gentleman, Mr. Stainbrook, had mentioned, uh, who knows where it came from and which houses um, and that type of thing. But this is the kind of precedent I think that maybe Rapid City might want to uh, set um, in helping neighboring communities recover from a tornado and I would think that our neighboring communities would be willing to even help Rapid City um, in its efforts if uh, parts of Rapid City were hit with a tornado. I don't doubt that there are people who surround Rapid City that would love to come in and help residents of Rapid City as well. So I'm going to support the precedent even if it is one. Thank you. And ironically, last Monday and Tuesday, uh, my staff as well as others uh, around the area participated in a FEMA debris management planning seminar to address issues just like this. I would report that we are working on that plan. We will have that in place, but we hope to address issues such as where, when, how these things will work, which may, th may make it just a little bit easier during future events. All right, Carl, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Okay, hey, we're going to go to Jerry right now. I think my intent was misunderstood. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm certainly willing to support and help the customers of, our, of ours and our citizens of Hermosa for the uncovered dis disaster or debris recovery. But in all of the prior cases that I've had experience with, we waited until we had the bill done, found out what we were reimbursed for, then we dealt with it as a council or the council dealt with. It. That's what we need to do. 
if, if the debris is collected and paid for by insurance, so be it. We've done this with fires. We've done it with, with Storm Atlas. We did Westbury Fire. We did the 2007 flood. Uh, we can, and I think that's the way we should do it. I don't think we should just say tonight, say it's free. That's not the way to do it. I think we should let, let the debris come in and what there isn't covered by, is not covered by insurance or other types of disaster. And I understand this is not the FEMA disaster. It's not big enough. We as a community can certainly step up and help them. The Hermosa community is a customer of the Repsey landfill. No problem helping them. But I think we should wait, find out what, what settles out, and we can make a decision and support them. That's not a problem. I'd just like to add that uh, when I went ahead and volunteered to have these put on my account, I explained at the landfill that it was only for a certain amount of days. It was from last Tuesday till Saturday. And I have an account of every ticket that came through that. I got the tickets, and Linda made this print off today. Of every, they kept track of everything that came through there specifically for that damage. And as of today, I told them no more on my account. We had everything cleaned up Saturday, so anything coming from this is when they're actually tearing down their buildings and the contractors are going in and rebuilding. They, I already told everybody at the meeting Tuesday night that your insurance will pay for this. I'm just saying I just want um, reimbursed for the money that the volunteers came out and picked up all this trash and put it in. Mr. Richard Smith with the Red Cross was there um, and probably 50 to 60 members of Fountain Springs Community Church came out and helped us on Saturday. And it was the volunteers and just the neighbors that got together and that's all we're asking the city for is just, you know, help us pay for the volunteers that came out and helped. And I think it's important in a disaster like this that, you know, if, if, if people ain't willing to step up and take a little bit of chance in helping each other out, where are we going to be next time there's a disaster? I'm sure if, you know, if we don't get no help from the city or anything, there's nobody going to want to take these steps in, in helping anybody out if they're going to get stuck with these big bills. Rep City has stepped forward and helped. That's not my point, sir. The stuff that you brought in, is any of that covered by insurance? Yes or no? I don't know if this would be or not. How would, you, how would the insurance companies depict of who's what was what? Because there's, if I understand right, there's three different insurance companies that were involved in that disaster out there. And now you know what they're going to be like is, well, we don't know if that came from our buildings or not. This is stuff that was scattered all over the draws and everything. So how do you go about deciding what insurance company pays for what? Emergency management's not here, are they? I, and I, I went right with him. I worked right with the Pennington County Emergency Management before I even started all this. No, let, me, let me finish, please. It was my understanding that they were in discussion with the insurance companies to possibly pay this. Is that true? Not from what I was but ever you told. Know, but you okay. know. I, I know that. That was my understanding. So My neighbor, the gal that is my next door neighbor, is she's insured three of the homes out there. And... Um, she said that they're, they're more than willing to, they'll take care of that. She told me that the people will be reimbursed for, you know, the damage to their buildings and everything and a certain portion of the cleanup. And I specifically asked her, I said, how do we, you know, what do we do with all this? And she said, well, you know, do all the collection you can, and, but there's no guarantee on how I'm going to get reimbursed for all this. But my understanding is a chance that they will. So that's, that could be, it could be wrong. And if, that's, so then, if it's not insured, I have no problem with, of, of uh, it's accepting it. But I'm just curious. I think there's some deals out there cooking that might help. That's all. I don't expect it to come out of your pocket or any other volunteers' pockets. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. And we're going to go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. And much along the same lines as Alderman Wright has indicated, that's why I supported his denial. Um, I'm very well known for not trying to satisfy an individual problem from the dais the day it comes forward. If this was a substitute motion to continue this for other consideration, I might vote differently. But since it's coming before us tonight, I don't think we have all the answers. I don't think we even have all the questions that are going to be raised on this. I appreciate you for, for letting everybody put um, their uh, pickup or the cleanup of the ditches and, and all the other common areas on your account and I agree with Alderman Wright and much of the council members up here we don't expect you to have to cover this but I am not comfortable reimbursing the two thousand dollars tonight when we don't know the full recovery of this whole process at this time so if we have to vote on this tonight my vote will be no if it is discussed continued to a later date 
when we have more information and we can understand what the recovery process is and what the payment plan is, I would be more comfortable voting on this issue at that time. But if the vote goes tonight, I will be voting no. Thank you. John Roberts. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I have to completely agree with uh, my ward made on this issue. I think that we don't have enough information coming in on this. I think that when we don't even know if any of it's going to be reimbursed, I think we're kind of putting the horse in front of the cart reimbursing him right now. And the same way, you know, I really appreciate what you did. I know that uh, during Storm Atlas, uh, me, a friend of mine, a few other people in our neighborhood, we took 18 dump loads of trees out to the landfill. We never expected anything back. We never asked for anything back. Neighbors help neighbors. I understand that. But until we really know if you're going to get reimbursed any on this, I really think that we are being a little forward on this issue. So thank you very much. Darla Drew. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have uh, a couple questions for Mr. Stainbrook, please. Well, that's okay. I don't have that many questions. So, Mr. Stainbrook, when you decided to um, take this on and, and um, pay for the the uh, dumping fees you were operating on information you got from the journal or what kind of information did you get no I actually talked to the neighbors down there that um, were affected directly by the storm and I, I don't know where they got their information or not or what but uh, they were the under understanding that uh, it was being taken care of okay. it was reported on on uh, the news Saturday night, KOTA news, that the fees were being waived. So, so you were being a good Samaritan and decided to help out your community. Uh, and these are general cleanup, so you really have no way of knowing where the fees would lie. You have a list of people that took stuff in, but you don't know where it came from or what property it was connected to, correct? Right. So how would you get insurance from that? I, I don't see that there's any really any possibility. And on that meeting Tuesday night, I specifically told the landowners that we would not be going and taking their buildings apart. We don't have, uh, I didn't want a bunch of volunteers literally going tearing buildings apart and hauling it to the landfill because I don't want anybody hurt. They don't have the experience and the contractors that come and redo their buildings will take care of that. We specifically just walked through the properties and picked up all the um, debris laying out in the fields and in the draws and that. And, uh, and there was some big items. I mean, there was roofs that literally came off and were laying down in the draws. And we, we cut them up into small pieces and hauled all that off. But as far as going on the property themselves, we never did anything as far as tearing the building apart itself and hauling it to the landfill. And um, so you were actually, I think, probably um, creating a safer situation for a lot of people in your community and, and folks around the area that would my quote, walk over nails or whatever, you're cleaning the stuff up and I, I think it's a safety concern. I'm going to um, support uh, Alderman Lewis's substitute motion to go ahead and um, help you with this cleanup bill at this point. Thank you. Now I'll go to Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. If I may make a second substitute motion to continue this to uh, July 5th City Council meeting. If I may retain the floor, Mayor. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. St. Brook, for doing what you're doing for the community. I really appreciate what you're uh, trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. But as you can tell, I, I, I don't have enough information. and. And the information that was uh, revealed at the meet by the media, and I don't know which one did it and how they did it. I know we had those conversations about going that direction for waiving the fees, but we I don't know that anybody made a decision on that, and where that hallway conversation got to the media, how that it got got to that point, I don't know. 
But if you can allow us to give us a couple more weeks to kind of, uh, shall I say, finding out more information that what is needed on this, uh, it, because I just, right now, just from the dais, I'm not comfortable making a decision either way, and I'd just like to get more, more information. Thank you. Okay, we have a substitute motion and a second to postpone this item until July 5th. And we'll go to Brad Esses. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And what a great country we live in. We're, we, we got in this bind because somebody just got with it and got her done. But, but having said that, I'm going to support this substitute motion or the second one. Because, Todd, if, you know, if you got a couple thousand dollar bill, you know, if there's three insurance companies involved, they're involved because the, the, the houses they insure are involved. Maybe the three insurance companies would split half that bill, and then we could forgive the other half. But, but until we get this sorted out, I just hopefully the, your bill can sit at the landfill. It won't if if we if it takes us two months to sort it out, that it, you don't be subject to any late fees, and let's just get it sorted out. That's kind of where I'm at, and and uh, you know, like I say, maybe uh, obviously if that you don't know whose debris it is, but that debris belongs to somebody who sustained damage. So that I don't think the insurance companies can totally disregard it, and maybe you can get maybe you can get the the three of them to pick up half the bill, and uh, you know maybe you can get your neighbors to talk to their insurance companies, and and then let's just see where they're at, and that's and then we'll polish up it when when we know. But I have absolutely no intention, uh, as far as my vote's concerned, to to, to saddle you with that bill. It, it, you know you did. Uh, I hope I hope that if if uh, I'm involved in a disaster, you're my neighbor too, so thanks. Well, I appreciate the council at least just taking a look at this, and I, I would ask that in the future that uh, maybe Carl with the waste management, maybe they can figure out something that uh, when there's a dis disaster like this that people can step up and, and help their neighbors get stuff taken care of, taken care of a little quicker and, and not have to go through something like this. So I don't know how to do it, but hopefully it'll something can be improved. But I do appreciate the council looking at this. And I really would like to thank the American Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and the Fountain Springs Community Church for helping us this last weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, sir, one more question for you, Mr. Stenberg. Do you have a bill coming due like in the near future on this? Like how much time do you have to pay for your $2,000 bill? Or I, have a, I have a complete breakdown. W when's it due? The, the when's it due? Bill. It's usually due at the end of the month. Okay, just curious because this kind of reminds me of the old joke about plane crashes on the Canadian U.S. border where the survivors buried. I mean, this is just an issue where it's obviously we don't know where this debris came from. How are you going to charge it out to anybody? I just want to get it taken care of. I don't think it's fair if you have to pay it and I certainly know that we're going to probably eventually approve it anyway and I don't know how we're going to possibly ever separate it out and we sat up here two or three months ago and forgave a five hundred thousand dollar loan to the soccer people and we had of course we had, I voted for that and I'll vote for it twice on Sundays I got no problem with it but we're sitting here about two thousand dollars trying to help out a community that got hit by disaster my dad has a question just a second um, what, what's your company's name sir it's Bill Lender T-A-S-A-K Construction. Yes, okay, construction. But anyway, getting back to my point, you know, we do that all day long. We make huge votes, and then we pick apart things like $2,000 bill to help a community out that had a hit by a disaster. And I think it's just kind of, I understand everybody's trying to be, you know, the precedent thing, but as Mr. Laurenti said, uh, this is a good precedent. This is not one of those things you worry about a whole heck of a lot, and hopefully we don't have to worry about it. And if it does help happen, great, then we'll do it every time. I mean, you got to help out your neighbors. You got to help out people when they're in trouble. That's more important than a lot of things. So, I probably vote against this substitute motion, just in the, the spirit of I want to get this taken care of tonight. But I do appreciate you and your your neighbors taking taking a chance on it, and hopefully you get reimbursed, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Steve Laurenti. Okay. So the substitute motion is to postpone this to July fifth. The only person we haven't heard from in the room that uh, put in a request for him was Mr. Smith. Would you like to say anything, sir? 
Thank you, Mayor, Mayor and thank you, Council members. Um, just first, I want to start off by apologizing. We were the one that put out the press release. Um, we put that out as it was a misunderstanding. We had lots going on during that time, and so we were communicating over the phone, and that ended up coming out from somebody. Again, we apologize for that. We don't make commitments for cities, and we don't make com commitments for counties, so I apologize that that came out from us that kind of started with that. But to go back just a little bit, um, was it the community meeting? We were there Monday night after the tornado, then we're out there Tuesday out talking with folks, seeing what was going on. Visited with Mr. Stainbrook, who, who will just say his house wasn't impacted. He just brought everybody together at his home and said, let's get a plan, let's get this together so we can get this done. What we recognize in all the disasters we've worked on, the best time to get something done is immediately after it happens. The longer it goes on, the less attention that gets. So he'd taken that on and kind of started that process. As we were talking through that, the first thing he'd mentioned was that they were talking to the insurance companies to get the insurance companies involved to pay for as much as they could. Um, I then contacted Dustin Willett from uh, Pennington County Emergency Management, said this is the situation. We may want to look at trying to reach out and see just what can be done. And then Dustin took it from there, and I know he had contact with a couple of folks, a couple of council members, and then just started looking at that. What we want to do is get ahead of that and not behind that process. So that's kind of what brought us to where we are at today. Um, we wanted to get the groups of volunteers while we had them out there. Fountain Springs Community Church did have an event. We reached out, contacted them. They then brought down volunteers that, again, that went and helped, picked up everything. If you've ever been involved in a tornado or ever seen what happens, um, it was about a four-mile stretch, about probably 200 yards wide, full of people's personal belongings, pictures, birth certificates, license plates, about everything you can imagine that's, that's somebody's personal belongings when a tornado comes through. So we really wanted to start helping that family to get that back together. And so my concern was that Mr. Stainbrook, we've seen happen in the past, one good individual steps forward, and then that person ends up with a large bill because not all those pieces go together. Um, insurance companies some, can sometimes play against each other and say not doing that. So that was the process by which we wanted to get those things started so that we could make sure that one person didn't get stuck with that. So that's why we're here to support what was going on. And this is just to let you know that it was a great community effort that took place out there. And, we're just really proud of what they did, and it makes us proud to live in South Dakota. So thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to vote on this issue of postponing it to July 5th. And I'll uh, just let Mr. Stainbrook know that we're, uh, we will hold on to that bill and waive any late fees that uh, would normally be assessed to it. Uh, I don't see the problem with that. So uh, all in favor of the motion postponed, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Two ayes from Darla Drew and Chad Lewis. Is that correct? Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Two no's. Okay. Motion passes. Now on to uh, public hearing items, items 38 through 50. We'll open public comment on uh, these items, and we have a bunch of speaker request forms for item number 46. So we'll start with Ron Sasso. Three minutes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, basically, I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, this item. I was involved with the initial uh, drafting of this ordinance uh, back in 2012, 5878. Uh, after receiving concerns from a, a citizen who had her power knocked out from falling branches. At that time, I met with the city's urban forester. Then it was Gary Garner. Uh, we worked uh, to draft an ordinance that basically would enable us, uh, the city, to remove dead, diseased, dying trees uh, that didn't fit the original uh, ordinance, but also we wanted to make sure we wouldn't be overstepping the bounds of personal freedoms. I believe this is a case where the ordinance's language probably needs to be further clarified. The intent of the ordinance was that it would expand the definition of hazardous tree, trees by including dead disease or has obvious visible defects and either one constitutes a hazard to life or property, or harbors pests which constitute a threat to other trees within the city. Now, here's the big thing. Uh, the, the ordinance, uh, actually a couple, couple big things. The ordinance further requires notification of the owners. Section B clearly states the city shall notify the owners of such trees in writing 
to remove the trees within such reasonable time as shall be determined by the urban forester. Now, at the time when this ordinance was being drafted and being worked on, the urban forester was going out and looking at the trees. Since this ordinance took place, there have, the urban forester is different now, the code enforcement officer is different now, and the city attorney who's been handling this is also different. So I think that's one of the cases where we've got what the intent of the ordinance was and what's happening are two different things. So that's, that's my concern. Basically, every time a tree is taken down, the urban forester is supposed to go out, examine it, determine whether or not it is dead, disease, dying, or presents a hazard potentially to fall, and how urgent is that concern? Without the urban forester going out and seeing that, that can't be determined, and basically it sounds like he's been going out and looking at stumps. So the whole process is backwards right now. That's my concern. That's what I believe needs to be addressed. So thank you. Again, the next speaker request form from Dave Phelps. Good evening, thank you. Uh, the only reason I'm here is to corroborate uh, the person involved that owns the property uh, that uh, I worked with him. I hauled a uh, uh, electric lift uh, uh, over to his house that he, re to his rental property that he had uh, uh, rented. I worked with him for two days to cut dead limbs off of a tree that wasn't entirely dead. It had green foliage on it, and the intent was to uh, remove the dead uh, parts of the tree and allow the uh, living uh, core of the tree to sprout new branches that would grow out and provide shade and shelter for the tenants' cars. And uh, uh, we uh, worked for two days over a weekend. We removed uh, as many limbs as we could until we got too close to the power lines that ran through the tree. And uh, uh, we s stopped there to uh, notify uh, uh, Black Hills Power to come and lower their, their lines so we could take the rest of the dead limbs off. In between that happening and in our work, uh, somebody came and cut it down and it's just a stump. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. And the next request form is from Phil Jensen. Thank you. <clears throat> I've given several exhibits to the council members, and at this point I'll look at uh, item C, um, number one and two. Uh, chronology of Trees at 719 12th Street. October 1st, I received a postcard last year from Code Enforcement instructing me to remove dead tree. Uh, for some reason, the word dead was not included in that uh, copy that you have. Uh, by 11215. Uh, I did not choose to uh, appeal within seven days because I had every intention of cutting the dead out of that tree as uh, Mr. Phelps had said, we rented a cherry picker and we cut out as much as we could. And then uh, the holidays were upon us and, and then the session began. And, uh, and then uh, it became obvious that I was going to have to wait till spring to cut out the remaining dead because the, uh, I didn't want to cut out live branches from the tree and I wouldn't know until it was starting to bud out again. Um, Let's see. Um, this morning, I asked Jess Rogers, uh, city attorney, what ordinance gave code enforcement the authority to willy-nilly cut cutting, to start cutting other trees down deemed dead by the code enforcement officer. And uh, she said it was covered by this ordinance. Well, this ordinance, it is not clear at all. And former councilman uh, Ron Sasso, who drafted this ordinance, made clear that it, it was not clear. 
in that in that it does need some work. Um, Item 7 on the uh, uh, Exhibit C, April 1st, 2016, Urban Forester Andy Bernard observed the tree stumps at 719 12th Street with Code Enforcement Officer Clayton. This was the only visit to these trees by the Urban Forester. Now, normally you'd think, you know, the ordinance says clearly, the city shall have the right to inspect and cause the removal of any dead, diseased trees or any part thereof or on private property within the city if the trees or any part thereof are, and then it lists items one, two, A, and B. And then it says, the city shall notify the owners of such trees in writing to remove the trees within such reasonable time as shall be determined by the urban forester. Well, the urban forester has to see the tree before they can, before he can determine the, the health and viability of the tree and then determine the time frame. You know, if it's infested with bugs, then it needs to be cut down probably a lot quicker than a month or 45 days. And in this case, the, the tree was deemed dead. And as you can see from exhibit uh, A, this photo was taken. I was over there visiting the property and there was a drone overhead and I thought that was unusual. So I took a picture of it. Then I took a picture of the house then I caught all this live in the, that's just part of the tree and it's extremely green and it provided all kinds of shade for the tenants. And uh, as you can see on exhibit A, it's not a dead tree. It's not even close to being a dead tree. Mr. Jensen, your time is up, sir. Thank you. And now we'll hear from David Johnson on the same item. Good evening. Um, my name is Dave Johnson. I was brought, to, or I was asked to come and speak tonight on behalf of Adam Bradsky on a on a 1318 East East Franklin Street. Um, I am a native of Rapid City, graduated from School of Mines and USD. I've been operating a tree care company here for 36 years, and uh, I am a former member of the Rapid City Urban Forestry Council. I was a member for about 15 years on that on that committee. I am a certified arborist, certified by the South Dakota Arborist Association. I'm also a certified arborist by the International Society of Arboriculture. And uh, currently the only person in South Dakota who is a registered consulting arborist by the American Society of Consulting Arborists, which is the only group that, uh, that credentials arborists for litigation purposes. The reason that I'm here is I was asked to go look at some trees that were cut down at that address. And from all indications that I saw several, and I took several pictures, many of the trees were not dead that were cut down. Um, there was one stump that was clearly a dead tree. Uh, these were Siberian elm. They've got a nasty reputation. As, um, as I've been cutting these trees down for decades now. I want to point out that, the, you know, when I was on the Urban Forestry Council, I was appointed by Mayor Shaw, and I've been uh, in doing tree work here in Rapid City since Don Barnett was the mayor. And we've had a city ordinance for tree dead and dying trees much, much longer than what uh, Mr. Sasso was speaking of. It's been, it's been on the books for decades. And we've addressed the issue where citizens come before the Urban Forestry Council with complaints. And that's the method for which um, property owners who have complaints about the ordinance, they're supposed to by, you know, by just normal city or normal civil behavior, they're supposed to go before the Urban Forestry Council and recognize their grief. And then the Urban Forestry Council transfers that complaint up to further levels. The city of Rapid City must have an, or, an ordinance with some teeth because we, many, many, many times over the decades, we've had cuts or we've had homeowners, uh, landowners, landlords who do not address 
dangerous trees. And so we need to have an ordinance that carries, carries some weight and has some teeth in it. In the case of 1318 East St. Franklin, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a case where I'm concerned that the, the trees weren't dead when they were cut down. Thank you. I'll go to Adam Bradsky. Thank you, council members. My name is Adam Bradsky, and I'm an attorney representing Wilma Curlis as trustee of the Roman and Wilma Curlis Revocable Living Trust. Uh, we're here today because in March of this year, Wilma came onto her property where, you know, she grew up in that neighborhood, raising kids for the last 40 to 50 years to find that eight of the nine trees on this specific lot were cut down and she had no idea this was going to happen. Um, the big thing here is no notice was ever given to Wilma as trustee, and I talked to uh, the city, assistant city attorney, Jessica Rogers, and she sent me the file that the city attorney's office had regarding this situation and there was nothing in there showing that an investigation was made, no risk assessment forms or anything like that. Um, the only thing that I saw in there that seemed relevant was an email um, sent by the urban forester to uh, Mr. Mr. Bernard, sent to Mr. McLean in March 16th after the trees were removed, saying that he agreed that the trees needed to be removed after they had been removed from the property. So uh, as Mr. Johnson said, he didn't think the trees were dead when they were removed. And uh, it's just interesting to me that the urban forester, there's nothing in the city file um, talking about how there was any inspection or anything done until after the fact. And so uh, we request that, you know, to add insult to injury, uh, Wilma was stuck with a bill for $4,542. Um, from a company out of Iowa that did the removal. And so we just ask that this bill be waived, that um, it, it's not assessed against the property, and she would really like that the eight trees that were removed be replanted so that you know, she can have her trees back. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to item number 47, uh, speaker request form, Kent Haig. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, I'm Kent Haig, president of uh, El Terra Development Company. Uh, just here to reaffirm the discussions we had at Legal and Finance that we requested this matter be continued to the July 18th meeting. Uh, we've made a lot of uh, progress, had some very good meetings with staff, have been very helpful on uh, kind of sorting out make, uh, some of the uh, questions and making it uh, primed for a more clear presentation on the 18th. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that'll close the uh, public hearing portion of this uh, meeting. And now we're on to the consent public hearing items, items 38 through 46. Would the council like to remove any of those items? Go to Jerry Wright. Number 46? What to be pulled? Are there any other items besides 46 that you want to pull from consent? Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve all the items of um, 38. 8 through 46, with the exception of 46. Uh, all in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll go on to item 46. This is to approve resolution number 2016-028C, levying assessment for cleanup of miscellaneous property, Roman and Wilma Curlis, revocable living trust, and Marshall Lee Enterprises, uh, these names continued from the June 6, 2016 City Council meeting. 
I think for the ease of the uh, discussion here, uh, we should divide these, divide this into two questions, one surrounding the Curlis uh, issue and one uh, surrounding the Marshall Lee issue. Uh, any objection to dividing the question? Okay. Um, then we're on to Jerry Wright. Let's uh, let me, let's be specific here. Sorry about that. Let's let's handle item number forty-six, question number one, which will be the Curlis uh, issue. Does anyone want to speak on that? Sure. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I guess the only concerns I have. I agree with Dave's comment that we need to have a tough ordinance to get rid of these trees that are a problem. Mm -hmm. But something haunts me on this is that is our ordinance, as Mr. Sasso brought out, says that the urban forester is to be involved, and apparently he was not. So that bothers me. And the other thing that bothers me is that this says Wilma's property. It says that. Uh, there to be notified, and if, if, if I remember a statement from Adam, she was not notified. Is that true? Would you would you step to the podium and make that statement, please? Again. Yes, Alderman uh, Wilma never received notice. So my concern is that the, the due process. I think the bill is probably owed, but the due process, and according to her own ordinance, was not followed. Am I correct? And I'll leave that question to our attorney and to other members of the council. We, our owner specifically says the urban forester is supposed to take this decision and that the owners are supposed to be notified and we're being told by Wilma's attorney that she was not notified. So. Okay, just a, just a point of order and maybe that's uh, what uh, the assistant city attorney is gonna answer but the uh, Ordinance does not require that the urban forester do an inspection of the tree. It, is, it requires that the urban forester um, establish a reasonable time for the removal of the trees. That is the extent of the language in the uh, ordinance. Uh, thank you. This is Jess Rogers, uh, City Attorney's Office, and that was part of what I, my response to Alderman Wright was going to be, that the ordinance just says that the urban forester is involved in the re determining the reasonable time to remove the trees, so he is involved to that extent. Uh, as to the other part of your question about the notice, uh, if you'll notice in the materials that Mr. Bradsky attached, there's a cover letter from me with our file. The notice is contained in that file. So the notice was sent. Code enforcement does monitor whether mail is returned. We send it to the property owner's address of record. Um, and this was mailed out like any other. It was not returned. So someone in that household did get notice. So let me, to clarify the point here, it says the urban forester is to make the decision for the time of removal of the tree. Does it anywhere in the ordinance say code enforcement does that? To determine the time for the for the tree to be removed? Yeah. No, does, code just, does code enforcement have the authority to decide that tree is coming out? And the other question, but we'll get them both in one shot, okay. is you, do you have proof that we don't use return receipt letter, certified letter, correct? We just send a letter out, and then we, because it doesn't come back first class, we assume that they received it, is that correct? I believe that's correct, yeah. Is uh, that a good process? You tell me. That is no, the process isn't. we currently no, it use. No, it isn't. When, you're, when you're dealing with somebody's property and money, I think we should be using that process. Okay. Thank you. That's my concern on this. I think the, the trees probably did have to come out. I think the bills are fair, but I am concerned that I'm not sure we followed the spirit of the ordinances. That's what bothers me. I'm both, and I'll let it go at that. Thank you. John Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a question for Barb Garcia, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Mayor. That'd be fine. <clears throat> you knew you were gonna get in the middle of this, didn't you, Barb? Uh, my question to you is, um, I, I'm sure you remember those trees at 1205 Allen Street that uh, it took over two years to remove um, when I was working with the neighbors up there. But at that time, I was under the impression 
uh, that the urban forester had to look at those trees to determine whether or not they were partially dead, part dead, dying, diseased. I wasn't under the impression that our code enforcement officers were arborists because that was, if you remember, a very long process to get everything taken care of there. And now all of a sudden it seems like we're just kind of randomly chopping down people's trees. Not exactly, no. Um, the standard procedure is that if a tree is obviously dead, then they will make a determination and issue the notice. The person has the right to appeal that, contact our office, say they don't agree with the um, deal. Neither of these parties contacted our office to even discuss it. Um, and if there is any question whatsoever of whether a tree is dead, if there are any green leaves on it, then they do contact the city forester and have him make the determination because we don't want that liability on us. So we have had him go out and look at any. The ones that were cut down at the time they were looked at, other trees all around them were out in leaf. Theirs had none on it. There was no real question of whether they were dead. And so that is where the letter was issued. Um, way more time than what was allowed went by from the time the notices were given. One was in October. The tree wasn't taken out until February. They had more than enough time to have contacted the office. And even after the time they were taken down, it was still a couple of weeks before we heard from them. Um, and that was on the Curlis deal. So there have been, uh, there were some leaves on, or in a picture, it appeared there were leaves on one of the trees that, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, Jensen's tree. Um, but when you look at the picture and you zoom out, that tree that had green leaves was actually across the street in another yard. Um, the tree itself was actually dead in the pictures. So, um, no, we don't usually make those decisions ourselves. If there's any question, it is referred to the forester. And in this case, since it was brought up after the fact that it was an issue, we had the forester go out and give his determination. Thank you very much, Barb. It's your turn. It's your turn. I'm pointing at you, Mr. Johnson. I do have a couple of questions for you. How can I help you, Mr. Roberts? <laughs> now, on this, this issue, you said you went out and looked at the stumps, and in your opinion, um, the trees were probably not dead. Yes, and this issue is on the Corillus issue, right? Yes, yes. The, uh, the other issue, I you know, just uh, can't comment on that one. I was asked by the attorney to come out and look at the tree stumps, and there was also debris remaining from, from the company that cut the trees down that, as far as I know, it's still there that indicated there were many. You know, I've got pictures. I can show the council. I, I have seen your pictures. I was sitting there with you yeah. earlier looking at your pictures. There, there, yeah. You know, again, I want to point out, you know, I'm, as an urban forestry council member, we've seen people come before with issues. The urban, the urban Forestry Board in the city of Rapid City has to have a strong ordinance on this one because we can't have dead trees. People will not take care of their dead trees unless they're forced, and many, many times that's the case. And the city has to have this. I'm 100% behind city parks and the city of Rapid City and the urban forester when it comes to removing dead trees. We have to have that. But we can't be cutting down trees that have partial life in them without the urban forester going out and looking at. Or, in fact, a city, a, a, a certified arborist needs to be involved in this. And, and I don't know when. You're, you're answering my questions Thank that you. I would have been asking you. But I, I do have a question for you. Do you believe that trees like these, even if, if they are losing some of their leaves, if you prune them back and you take care of your tree, will your tree come back? Many times they will. Siberian elm, that's usually not the case. You can't go out and just cut out the dead portion of a Siberian elm because 50, 60, and 70% of the tree is dead normally before 
uh, before it incorporates a letter from the. And from I think the, one of the one of the answers that you had to a question I didn't make yet was, do you believe that that our code enforcement officials are are qualified to make these kind of decisions whether a tree is dead or not code enforcement yes I, I yeah they're qualified because they can go out and they can they can get a hold of people that are certified i think mr bernard is a certified arborist he's fully capable but on their him. own on their own code without without having somebody that is a qualified person I'd, take a I'd, look at these i don't trees. know the credentials of the code enforcement people i I don't believe any of them are certified arborists. I believe that a certified arborist should be involved in, in uh, making the determination about whether a tree should be removed or not. And in the case of Corellis, the trees weren't dead. It's that simple. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Jess, I'll start with you. Mayor, may I address a question yes. too? Thank yes, you. Ma'am. Hi, Jessica Rogers. Um, let me start with you. So in this case, um, as Barb Garcia already pointed out, notification went out in October. The trees were removed in February. Who initiated the first complaint? Was it the code enforcement officers that came across this property of eight or nine trees and eight of them were looked, appeared to be dying or dead? Because everybody keeps referring to dead, but our ordinance is dying or dead. So even if they weren't dead, they may have been dying. Um, I believe, and Barb or Clayton can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was code enforcement that w did a visual inspection of the property and first noticed that they were dead and sent the notice to the property owner. Okay, so the code enforcement officers were just out and about looking for dead trees at that time. My understanding is this is sort of an annual ritual for code enforcement, that there's a certain time of year when they do drive around and make a note of dead trees and then send out lots of these notices at one time. Okay, thank you. That was the question I had. Go to Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I, I think we're not telling the whole story here. I mean, honestly, if you look at some of the documentation, the uh, urban forester was involved in the decision process. He did look at the trees. Um, a day, or, even if it's sometime after, obviously these trees were, according to our ordinance, something that was a violation because they don't need to be completely leafless there need to be defects obvious defects so there were obvious defects with these trees um, I don't think code enforcement goes around looking for people to you know persecute um, with uh, one branch that might have no leaves on it so I think we're dealing with something here especially when we see the email from our urban forester saying such things as um, Upon an inspection of the stumps and the photos provided, these trees were either completely dead or in an irre irreversible state of decline. The dead trees posed a hazard to person or property within the potential fall area of those trees. With the photos, leftover stumps, and our conversation about the trees being leafless in late September, early October, I agree that the trees needed to be removed. That's from our urban forester. So our urban forester was involved. Let's not pick apart the process. Do we need to make some improvements here and there? Yes. But the fact of the matter is, these trees were in decline. These were specifically trees that Mr. Johnson brought up that said they are notorious for having issues. We heard him say that. And these trees, according to our urban forester, were diseased or, or dead or in decline and would not recover. That's our urban forester, and I will support staff on this issue. Thank you. Richie Nordstrom. Well, not much more to add to that one. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Renty. It's very good. Uh, because, Andy, I was going to ask you the same question, but, uh, Mr. Bernard, if you could clarify your uh, email that you sent uh, to the, uh, to this, uh, see, this one went to uh, Clayton in this case here. But could you just clarify it? Because right now I'm hearing a dispute between a couple of experts but you're the person that's identified within the ordinance could you address that please uh, yes yeah, so I'm Andy Bernard the urban forester for Rapid City uh, I am an ISA certified arborist uh, hold a degree in uh, park management and horticulture um, could you tell me again what you'd like to be clarified essentially w I'm I'm listening to two experts here your documentation what you have and then what outside uh, sources have 
to, to say about this, but you're the one that's stated within the ordinance, within the city ordinance, to make that determination. I was just wondering if you could clarify or just make sure that I understand your email, and um, Alderman Rolanti quoted it, but it, I just wanted to make sure that you, you said this. Uh, yeah, I wrote that email. That's, Thank that's, you. I, I did not see the trees before they came down. I, I saw them after the fact, as, as my email states. So you, you're, you're capable of making a determination at once the trees are removed? Uh, in this instance, yes. Uh, the aerial photography of that area from uh, September 2015 uh, shows dead trees, so you can definitely see them. Uh, and I was also looking at the pictures here, too, um, that, that I'm looking at is that these, these trees were definitely in decline at that point. Thank you, Andy. Um, it, I appreciate your comments. Um, if I can call on Barb Garcia again, please. Barbara, we, we have this, I don't know, I've, I don't want to call it ongoing situation, but it seems like uh, there's a, a happenstance of mail not being received. We don't have any control over that mail once it's sent to the uh, uh, current state of residence, who's ever owns that property. We did do that delivery, and once it's out of our control, then that's it. We don't have any more control over this issue then, right, on the mail? That's true. So it, it, they are alleging that we do not, they are not getting their, this mail or uh, correspondence from your, your department or division on this. Is there a way we, that we can, um, is there a, a backup process or a procedure or a safeguard that's built into this? Short of sending out two notices on everything, I don't know what that would be because we would never know that they don't get it. Have you because we, well, for instance, we did 116 dead trees in 2015. Yes. We only abated 16 trees in 2015. And of those trees, only two people said they didn't get their mail. So I don't know what the answer is. Um, Jess and I have discussed whether we need to send out uh, something where they have to sign for it on something where it's a high dollar amount. We don't always know what the dollar amount's going to be at the time we're sending notice. And that's why it's good if they contact our office if there's any questions about the notice that they get. Um, so, you know, we're exploring, <coughs> trying to figure out what is the best way because we don't like being in this position either any more than they do. So um, short of sending out something that has to be signed for, but that's costly. And um, you know, in the past, I think I heard before, long before I came on board, that was done many years ago, and then okay. it was stopped. Ms. Garcia, if I can interrupt your yeah. thought there, is that don't the staff normally go out as informal and visit the properties one more time any, anyway? Yes, we have to go back and see if they've abated it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's, that's all I need. Thank you. I'll yield. Uh, Darla Drew. Thank you, Mayor. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, who do I have the question for? Jess, I, I guess I'll ask you. Um, how many trees were taken off the Curlis property? I believe there were eight. That seems like an unusually large amount of trees. And uh, barring notification by mail, I would think that in, in future, if you um, are going to be doing that number of trees anywhere, that you would make a personal effort to try and contact the, the property owner so that we don't have this kind of situation again. I just think it's an unusual amount of trees. I mean, if it's one or two trees, maybe, maybe that would be overlooked, but eight? is a lot, and it's an expensive um, venture for the city and for Mrs. Curlis, and I would just think that your, your office should make more of a, a commitment to getting a hold of these people in the future and telling them what they're really looking at, because I think that's our obligation to talk to them. Thank you. We'll go to Jerry Wright for one minute, 30 seconds. I'm still concerned there's a thing called certified return receipt mail we should be using on these situations. 
And if it's refused, there's a record of that by the post office that comes back to us. I don't believe a record in the file proves it was mailed or delivered. And I think Mr. Jensen admits in his note that he did receive a postcard, but Wilma, through her attorney, states that she did not. So I have a problem with this in our process. And I believe the urban forester should be involved before the cut down. Thank you. Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm a little bit conflicted on this. I do understand the need to uh, remove the dead trees and make sure that we keep the area safe and then we got to rely on our experts to know what's dead and what's not. Um, the notification thing I understand is pretty easy to say you never got the notification. I understand people say that all the time for stuff, but you said you had two people that said they didn't, didn't, said they didn't receive the notification. Is that correct, Jess, something like that? Or Barb, sorry, whoever said that. I believe it was Barb. She said two, but I think someone yeah. just pointed out that Mr. Jensen actually acknowledged that he did get right. the notice, so, so I think it's actually one. Two out of 300 and something. So in other words, it's probably pretty believable when someone says they didn't get it, they probably didn't get it, especially considering I know the, I don't know the family, but I know the family in this situation. I know they've always done the right thing and pay their bills and they take care of things when they get them. I, don't, I can't imagine they would ignore notification if they got it. So I'm gonna tend to believe them that they didn't get the notification. I just don't know how you deal with the fact that the trees obviously need to be removed according to the experts and I'm certainly not a tree expert by any stretch of the imagination. However, I, I don't know how you weigh that against, would have been, my question is this. Okay, say they got the notice and they removed them themselves. What would the cost be comparable? And can anybody answer that question? Or how much more would it be? Or how much less would it be to have, to have them done it themselves? It's my understanding that, I mean, we hire a tree service just like any private citizen would. And then I believe there's a $42 administrative fee. Right. So we're just paying someone like any homeowner would and then adding on $42. Right. But here's my, my problem with that is I've, I've received or not received notices, or maybe I have, <laughs> on, on, on things like with uh, properties we owned, you know, that were being developed and the, the lawn had to be mowed or something like that and we didn't notice it and it just got it came up later and it was like you know 200 bucks to mow like a 300 square foot area of of, of grass and it just seems like that was completely out of line paid it anyway because it's part of the development cost but it just so I, I wonder if those fees are, are legitimately I'm not questioning anybody's work or prices I understand that you know the cost of the cost I just think that you're kind of they're getting jacked up a little bit you know Dave, how, how do you feel? Can I, Mr. Johnson, can you answer that question for me, sir? As far as the, uh, you know, if you, it, the cost, I mean, obviously you're in the business. It's, it's your best interest <laughs> to. Uh, yeah, uh, you're going to get me on my soapbox here. Um, it's not a matter of uh, companies gouging or inflating their prices because the standard procedure in the past, when I was on the board, is that there were three bids requested. In this specific case, I was just a little bit disgruntled that they hired an out-of-state company, and there's plenty of tree companies, credentialed tree companies in the city, who are fully qualified to do the local that, tree work for the city. Thank you, sir. And that speaks yeah. to my point, I guess. Yeah. Is, I, I just wonder if we're... There's, there's, no, there's no gouging going on. It's all a public issue. No, I understand that, but I'm saying as far as an out-of-state company comes in, they don't have as much skin in the game as you do, and obviously you're now an elected official. You understand that... Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. But anyway, my point being is that I don't know how we weigh the idea that the, obviously if the trees need to be removed, they need to be removed. But I just think it would have been cheaper for them to had the chance to do it themselves. And I, I'm going to believe them that they got the didn't get the notification. I, I, so I'm going to vote against it, I guess, at this point, just because I think we should have got notification and a due process, like Mr. Wright was saying. Thank you. Okay, go back to Steve Laurenti. Thank you, Mayor. And I, uh, I just I don't like where the conversation is going. Honestly, I I think that the city's process has been in place. This is how code enforcement does all of the issues that we have with property not being taken care of by owners. So us trying to turn it on its head all of a sudden because we have an issue here um, that somebody's brought before us doesn't mean we need to reinvent the process and create a whole new wheel. The process works. Now the fact of the matter is whether they claimed that they didn't receive their notice, which would be Fairly common, I think, for most people who would come in front of us and say, I never received a notice. And now I believe these people probably didn't get it in their hands, but the responsibility still lies on the homeowner or the owner of that property. I've removed three trees from my own yard because of fire blight. They were fruit-bearing trees. I didn't wait for code enforcement to come out and identify it. I removed those three trees, took them to 
the landfill and they're gone. So the responsibility is on the owner, owners, the trust, whoever it is that's taking care of that particular property. They knew that those trees were either partially dead, dying, and that some of them were completely dead. Our arborist says that specifically. So the onus is not on the city to make sure that they get something in their hands. The onus is on the property owner to make sure that their property is well taken care of before they come and see us. We shouldn't be even talking to these people. The fact of the matter is that they're in front of us today is because they didn't take the personal responsibility to take care of this particular property as it should be. So I will support staff on this particular issue and I would urge my colleagues to support the process as it stands. If you identify or see something in the process that needs to be improved, bring it back on the agenda. Bring it up through Public Works or Legal and Finance and let's deal with it. But on this particular issue, the onus is not on the city. It's on the people who own those properties. They need to maintain those properties. Thank you. And now we'll go back to Chad Lewis for a minute 30. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Bradsky, to your knowledge, is your client uh, an arborist? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. So there's probably wouldn't know a dead tree if you saw one for sure? No. As far as their individual responsibility to know if it's a dead tree and remove it? Correct. And I think it's important to note when we talk about process, we're talking about constitutional due process, not necessarily the way things are done um, as the government, you know, the city. No, that's school. fine, sir. I just, I just wanted to know that as to answer my question was just whether or not she would know a dead tree, because I certainly don't know if I'd know a dead tree for 100%. And as far as my point about notification, two people out of 316 or something like that seems like a pretty fair, I mean, most people are acknowledging it, they're getting their notification. I tend to totally believe that she never got a notification if she didn't get it. I mean, I can't see your family or this family, her family, whoever, ignoring it. I just know better. Right. Whatever be that as it may, I just know, I know what I'm talking about. I'll put that out there. I, I know the family be completely honorable. They do the right thing. Every chance they get a chance time. And so I will not by any means say, I have personal knowledge of it. I'm going to say that she didn't get the notification. And therefore, I'm going to stand up for her and say, hey, uh, how the hell would she know it was a dead tree? If she's not an arborist, so I'm going to back her up. I'm going to say that we probably shouldn't have cut him down without at least knocking on the door. Richie Nordstrom has 25 seconds. If, can I ask a question of Clayton McLean? You can do it in 25 seconds. Clayton, you normally follow up with uh, informal responses to these uh, uh, addresses that have these hazardous, hazardous trees, don't you? Uh, should have you come up to the mic, and then thank you, Mayor. Hi, Clayton McLean, Code Enforcement Officer, for Rapid City. Um, Clayton, we're only, you, you we're normally only do an informal follow-up. We're only re required to want to send one notice. But you do follow-ups too. I mean, you personally go out and visit. Oh, I've seen I and heard your stories about. Doing I'm out follow -ups. in the community every day. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Now that we're all done with that, uh, Mr. Johnson, can I ask you one question, please? Mr. Mayor. You said these were Siberian elms? That's correct. Almost Pamelia. Almost oh, Pamelia. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you said that it, what I gathered from what you said was if you get them and they're already 50 or 60 percent dead, there may be no bringing them back. For the, yeah, that's general rule. Of thumb. Not, yes, yes. When you went out and looked at these trees and took pictures, could you tell if any of them were 50 or 60 percent dead? I'll, uh, I'm not under oath, but uh, yes, uh, they were they were probably at that at that point. But I, I believe that they they from pictures that I saw that they could have been pruned. I mean, we don't have a right. I don't believe, even as an arborist uh, who's concerned about safety, to determine if somebody should cut down a tree when instead it could have been pruned and kept alive. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Now, I, I don't believe there's a motion on this first question on item 46. Brad Estes. I'll make a motion to uphold the 
the staff finding for on the Curlis. If I get a second, I'd like to. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Go ahead. Listen, um, there's, the only sure way I know to kill a tree is to let me give it to me. <laughs> um, I guess I'm convinced that uh, based upon Mr. Johnson and, and our arborist's conversation that while the trees may not have been 100% dead, they were in a state that they needed attention and I'm comfortable with the fact that they were cut down. Um, I understand what Alderman Lewis is saying about notification, um, but to me when, if out of two, 300 people get letters, only two, two don't get them, I think we're doing our job. Um, I don't know if they got the darn letter or not. Um, I think maybe we ought to look into uh, doing certified letters or return receipt, but but that's something that's going to have to come later. But I got I got to call it the way and I, I sat here and listened, and I think everybody asked great questions, and and uh, I made the motion, and I'm going to support it. Thanks. Okay, we have a motion to approve the assessment on the Curlis property. Um, and we'll go to a roll call vote on that, please. Estes? Aye. Lewis? No. Drew? No. Roberts? No. Nordstrom? Aye. Scott? Aye. Laurenti? Aye. Wright? No. Tied poor poor? Chair votes in favor, motion passes. Now on to item number 46, the second question of that is the, yes? We're not spending money. This isn't an appropriation. Yeah, the, what this, Mr. Mayor, Please. What the statute requires is there has to be a majority of all the aldermen if it's a, an ordinance or something where there's uh, an obligation created against the municipality or um, spending money. And so I, with this resolution, you're assessing a property. I don't think it's any one of those three. So I think you can break the tie. Okay. Now we're on to item 46, the second question, which is the... Marshall Lee Enterprises, these are the trees on, is it Franklin Street? Oh, 12th Street, sorry. Okay. Starting fresh from that, do we have uh, a motion or speakers or? Item number 46 is to approve the resolution levying assessment for cleanup of miscellaneous property uh, for Marshall <coughs> Lee Enterprises. Moved to approve from Steve Laurenti. Second. Second by Manna Scott. And we'll go to John Roberts now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can I ask Senator Phil Jensen a question? Yes, you may. <laughs> Phil, uh, you had some testimony here earlier that you had started trimming these trees after you had got the postcard for the trees? Yes, we uh, rented a $150 uh, cherry picker over the weekend. We cut out quite a bit of dead from that tree. And as you can see from that one photo that shows part of the front of the house and the tree is in the back, there's plenty of green. And, and the, the way the code enforcement expressed, uh, the officer expressed himself, there, the tree wasn't even budding uh, come March. And this photo was taken July of 2015 last year and two months later the uh, the uh, postcard was sent out about a dead tree you got to be kidding this thing is green as can be you can see from the photo was that the tree at the back of the property or the front of the property 
That was the tree at the front of the property. I'm sorry, right behind the house, not toward the alley, but okay. the, the original one that the postcard said needed to be removed because it was dead. This tree is not dead. And we worked and worked and worked to try to cut the dead out of it. I guess the my concern here is when when you got your postcard, well, this is a different question. When you got your postcard, did you get a hold of code enforcement? No, I did not because I didn't see it was an issue. I was going to address the problem myself and rent a cherry picker, cut the dead out of it, and save the tree because it provided necessary shade for the tenants. That west sun just beats down on that side of the house. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Jensen. Barb, can I ask you one question? After these trees, notice was sent out, and he didn't get back with you, but according to him and his witness, they started trimming them. Did code enforcement go back out and look at these trees and notice that there was anything done to them, or did we just send out the people to cut them down? Yes, and I defer to Clayton so he can explain to you what he saw, but he did go back out. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, when I went and did my reinspection on November 1st, I believe, um, I did notice that there might have been one tree branch cut down, and then on the ground there was a pile of broken dead tree branches on the ground. I didn't know um, if it was from the windstorm or where those tree branches came from because I had no contact with Mr. Jensen. So it, it did look like there was one dead tree branch like, cut down, but the rest of it was dead too. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now we'll go to Brad Estes. Thank you. Mr. Jensen, could I ask you a question, please? Thank you. Yes. Are these two the same house? This, this house appears to be green, and this house appears to be blue, and, and the, I can't... The architectural details, it looks, it appears to me that we're looking at two different properties. But you're looking at the same tree from a different angle. The one in your right hand, sir, has a view from the front of the house, from the east. From the, the, other, yeah, from from the front the, of this house? Yeah, well, from the, just around the corner. What you're looking at is a view from Quincy looking straight to the north between a garage and a house huh. and there's the tree that sits behind my property and it's all greened out it's not dead it's all greened out this one and that one that's the same one from the from the east all right makes adds a little confusion on my part thank you yeah and and i might add that the um there were five branches cut off of that tree, not one. And your, the photo that code enforcement took shows that, if you have those in your file, that picture's there. And I've got it because uh, Officer Clayton gave me a photo. He sent he email, emailed it to me and I have it. Is there a motion on this item? Motion. Oh, that's right. Motion to approve and a second. I'd like to add one thing on this. Since this came through sort of an appeal process, um, Mr. Jensen had this item on a earlier city council agenda. It was on the consent calendar, and he wasn't here, so the item passed. And then following that, uh, he made an appointment and came in and met with me. Uh, he was with his council. And uh, we heard his story, which was uh, the, the issues that he believes uh, exempt him from paying the tree removal bill are that the city's urban forester was not involved in the diagnosis and the order resulting in the tree removal. 
which uh, we know is not um, an essential element of that ordinance, that the city's notice was insufficient. The trees were not identified specifically on, uh, on the property, nor were their photos included with the notice. Additionally, that the notice stated tree rather than trees. Uh, thirdly, that the tree uh, in one of the photographs uh, was not dead uh, because he believes he has a picture showing green leaves. Um, after hearing his story, I spoke with code enforcement officers. I reviewed the city ordinance. I spoke with the uh, urban forester. And this is what I found. I found that he admitted receiving the notice from the city that the trees were in violation of city ordinance. And, but although Mr. Jensen believed that the city should have sent out a second notice and also that the city should have called him to discuss the issue. Uh, at no time during this uh, several months that went by did Mr. Jensen call the city to discuss uh, the issue. Um, after the tree removal and at Mr. Jensen's request, the city provided him with copies of the photographs taken by code enforcement. The um, photograph which he's handed out tonight is photograph B. Uh, looks, um, looks substantially different when printed out, blown up and printed out as it does from the original photograph. In the original photograph, and if you see the circle that Mr. Jensen drew on this picture, if you look to the left of that circle, you see the green leaves as well. Those are, in code enforcement's uh, assessment, those are the same green leaves on the tree in a farther yard that are also showing through the tree on the Jensen property. So that's hard to accept that this tree was fully blooming uh, because we have uh, city officials who've been out there and testified A, that it was dead and B, that these, uh, there were no green leaves on that tree. Uh, the urban forester, I found out, has a close working relationship with code enforcement officers and often consults on tree removal cases. He believes that as any lay person, when a tree is uh, dead as a doornail, those are my words, not his, uh, that uh, the code enforcement is qualified to uh, determine that the tree is dead. So uh, I believe, uh, and, in, and in this appeal, uh, by the way, the city ordinance lays out an appeal process for this issue. It outlines that the process um, within seven days of the date of the order be appealed to the Urban Forestry Board and in this case there was no such appeal filed. And then a kind of an out, out of the ordinary appeal to the mayor's office. So I took the time and listened to that and gathered the information. It's my determination that Mr. Jensen, who's a state lawmaker and makes process for people, does not want to follow the city's process in this. Does not believe that he has any responsibility in this issue, in this, in this instance. It's clear by his testimony and, and uh, so on. So that's what I determined from the uh, appeal to the mayor's office. So having said that, there's a motion on the floor to approve the assessment for cleanup property. And uh, we'll go do another roll call vote, Heidi. Lewis. No. Drew. No. Roberts. No. Nordstrom. Aye. Scott. Aye. Laurenti. Aye. Wright. No. Estes. 4-4. Four, four. Yeah, Chair votes aye, so the motion passes. We're on to the non-consent public hearing items, items 47 through 50, and we'll go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 47 is a request by Kent Haig for Alta Terra Development to amend project plan for the tax increment district number 70, Highway 16 sewer for property generally described as being located along Cantron Boulevard from 5th Street to South U.S. Highway 16, then south along U.S. Highway 16 to Samus Trail and east to the proposed Highland Crossing subdivision. I make a motion to continue this item to the July 18th City Council meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. 
Opposed? Motion carries. Next item, please. Item number 48 is a second reading. Ordinance number 6117, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Code. A request by Bob Brandt for a rezoning from General Agricultural District to Office Commercial District for property generally described as being located at 2000 Promise Road. I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second for approval. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item item number 49 is a request by Fisk Land Surveying and Consulting Engineers Incorporated for Roger and Heidi Hanslick for a vacation of right-of-way for property generally described as being located at 4018 uh, Cali Baja Street. This item was continued from the June 6th City Council meeting since stipulations were not met. Stipulations have still not been met. I make a motion to continue this item to the July 5th City Council meeting. Okay, a motion and a second to delay this until July 5th. All in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 50 is a request by Fisk Land Surveying and Consulting Engineers Incorporated for Joel and Renee Landeen for a vacation of right away for property generally described as being located at 5280 Pinedale Circle. I make a motion to approve. Motion and a second for approval. All in favor of that motion? Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, bill list, item number 51, Pauline Sumption. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no additions to the bill list, so the total is that which is attached at $8,127,240.37. Okay. Motion to approve and a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Any objection to adjourn? Adjourned. Second.